In this video, we're going to focus on the oxidation of alcohols. So let's take some notes. Here's what you need to know. If you start with a methyl alcohol, like methanol, when you oxidize it, initially it's going to turn into an aldehyde. If you oxidize it further, it's going to go to the carboxylic acid level. And upon complete oxidation, it can convert all the way to CO2. Now, when you have a primary alcohol, if you oxidize it, it will go to the aldehyde level, but it doesn't have to stop there. If you oxidize it further, it will stop at the carboxylic acid level. Now, under the right conditions, and if you use strong oxidizing agents, like very, very strong oxidizing agents, and if you heat the solution, you could break the carbon-carbon bonds in ethanol and oxidize it all the way to CO2. But for the test that you're studying, for the most part, primary alcohols will typically stop at the carboxylic acid level when you use a regular strong oxidizing agent. So keep that in mind. If you have a secondary alcohol, This is going to stop at the ketone level upon oxidation. And tertiary alcohols, they're resistant to oxidation. So for the most part, it's going to be no reaction. Unless, of course, you have a reagent that's capable of breaking carbon-carbon bonds. Now, one of the reasons why tertiary alcohols are resistant to oxidation is because they don't have this alpha hydrogen that's present in primary and secondary alcohols. This carbon has no hydrogens on it. So that's one reason why tertiary alcohols are resistant to oxidation. Now let's go over some reagents that you want to be familiar with. Let's say we have one butanol and we want to react it with PCC. PCC is pyridinium chlorochromate. When you see PCC, it looks like this. So you have pyridine. Pyridine is basically a benzene ring with a nitrogen inside of it. You also have hydrochloric acid and chromium oxide or chromium trioxide. So that complex makes up PCC pyridinium chlorochromate. Now PCC is a mild oxidizing agent. It'll convert a primary alcohol to an aldehyde. If you were to use sodium dichromate, Na2Cr2O7, under acidic conditions, this is a strong oxidizing agent it'll convert the primary alcohol into a carboxylic acid. In other words, it'll take it all the way. If you were to react methanol with PCC, PCC will stop at the aldehyde level. So you'll get formaldehyde. But if you were to react methanol with sodium dichromate or chromic acid, under acidic conditions, these are strong oxidizing agents. It'll convert methanol all the way to CO2. It will fully oxidize it. So if you see chromic acid, sodium dichromate, those are strong oxidizing agents under acidic conditions. Pyridine with HCl, you no longer have a strong acid. What's going to happen here is this nitrogen will grab the proton and so you now have a weak acid instead of a strong acid. So even though you have chromium in PCC it's not under strongly acidic conditions. This is more of a weak acid when you combine pyridine and HCl. So the pH the concentration of the acid, it greatly affects 
the oxidizing strength of chromium. Now there's some other reagents that you want to be familiar with. If you use sodium hypochlorite with a weak acid like acetic acid at low temperature, this too works as a mild oxidizing agent. It'll convert the primary alcohol into an aldehyde. Another similar reaction is using sodium hypochlorite with a reagent called Tempo. Like PCC, it's a mild oxidizing agent. Tempo is a very stable free radical species. You have a nitrogen in a six-membered ring attached to an oxygen. Now this oxygen is a radical. It has an unpaired number of electrons, but with sodium hypochlorite, it works as a mild oxidizing agent. Now, another reagent that you want to be familiar with is this particular reaction called the Swern oxidation. The Swern oxidation uses reagents like DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide, oxalyl chloride, triethylamine, and dichloromethane. This too will convert a primary alcohol into an aldehyde. So it's a mild oxidizing agent. Now, if we were to take one butanol and react it with potassium permanganate under acidic conditions, this is a very strong oxidizing agent. It's going to oxidize it all the way. In this case, for a primary alcohol, it's going to oxidize it to a carboxylic acid. Now, there's some other reagents that you want to be familiar with, like the Jones reagent, the Collins reagent. Those are also oxidizing agents. Now, let's talk about the mechanism of the oxidation let me say that again, the oxidation reaction of, we're going to use 2-propanol with sodium hypochlorite with acetic acid. So the hypochlorite ion, it's a base. It's not a weak base. It's not very, it's not, you wouldn't classify it as a strong base, but it's a, it's a significant base. When you react it with acid, it's going to convert into HOCl, which is a weak acid. And upon reacting with additional acid, it could turn into this H2OCl plus. Now notice the size of the arrow. The majority of OCL will be in this form. A, a very small amount will be in this form because that form is not very stable, but this is going to be the reactive intermediate that we're going to focus on this reaction. So HOCL, hypochlorous acid, is a weak acid, but this is a strong acid. So here is H2OCl+. The oxygen is going to have a positive formal charge because it has three bonds and a lone pair. Now let's talk about the oxygen chlorine bond. Which of these two atoms would you say is more electronegative, chlorine or oxygen?
according to the Pauline scale of electronegativity, oxygen has an EM value of 3.5. For chlorine, its electronegativity value is 3.0. So oxygen is more electronegative than chlorine. Therefore, now this is different from formal charge, but in terms of partial charges, because oxygen is more electronegative, it's going to carry the partial negative charge in the ClO bond. Chlorine is going to bear the partial positive charge. So what this means is that this oxygen, which has a negative partial charge, is going to be attracted to the chlorine atom, which, is, which has a positive partial charge. So we're going to have an SN2-like reaction where the oxygen is going to attack the chlorine and we're going to kick out the leaving group, the leaving group being water. So this oxygen has three bonds now, so it's going to have a positive charge and water was removed. Water is a good leaving group. Now we could use water to remove this proton. Whenever oxygen has three bonds and a positive formal charge, any protons on it are relatively acidic. So now we have this reagent or this compound. Now in order for oxidation to occur, we need an elimination reaction. This is not like the E2 elimination reaction where we re would remove the beta proton. In this case, we're going to remove an alpha proton. So just to compare, here's a typical E2 reaction. Bromine is the leaving group, and hydrogen is the proton that we need to remove. So this is the carbon of interest. This proton here that is on the same carbon as the leaving group, that is the alpha proton. Adjacent to it is the beta proton. So in an E2 reaction, where we have a strong base, it removes the beta proton, not the alpha proton. And this is how we get an alkene. But for an oxidation reaction, the base is not going to remove the beta proton. It's going to remove the alpha proton. The alpha proton is on the same carbon as the leaving group. So we could use water as a base or we could use acetate. Let's use acetate. So acetate is going to act as a weak base. It's going to go for the alpha proton. The carbon hydrogen bond will break. Those electrons will be used to form this pi bond. So we're not getting an alkene, but we're getting a double bond like an E2 reaction. And then the leaving group, the chlorine, is going to leave. So that is an example of an alpha elimination reaction. The end result is that we get a ketone. So that's the general idea of the mechanism of an oxidation reaction. You need a base to remove the alpha proton, which will allow us to form a pi bond, and there needs to be a leaving group on this oxygen that we can kick out. Once we have all of that, we can oxidize the alcohol into an aldehyde or a ketone. Now here's a question for you. Let's consider phenol. Can phenol be oxidized? What would you say? If we were to react phenol with sodium dichromate and sulfuric acid, can this be oxidized? And what if we were to react this with terbutanol? Let's use chromic acid. 
Tertiary alcohols, for the most part, are unreactive towards oxidation reactions. So for all practical purposes, we could say no reaction for this process. And as we could see, there's no alpha hydrogens on this carbon. Now you might apply the same approach to phenol, saying that, hey, there's no alpha hydrogens on this carbon, so it would appear as if phenol will not be oxidized. However, the hydroxyl group is attached to a benzene ring. So you have free flowing pi electrons here. And it turns out that phenol can be oxidized into this compound, benzoquinone. So even though phenol doesn't have any alpha hydrogens, it can be oxidized uh, due to this aromatic ring and those free-flowing electrons. Now, benzoquinone can be reduced to hydroquinone. Hydroquinone looks like phenol, but you have two hydroxyl groups as opposed to one. So make sure you're aware of that. Even though phenol doesn't have any alpha hydrogens on the carbon that bears the hydroxyl group, it can still be oxidized. So it's a different case than a typical tertiary alcohol. But that's basically it for this video. So make sure you know the difference between a mild oxidizing agent and a strong oxidizing agent.